Uh, hi, Clinton. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing, Nathan? Good. Good to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Definitely. I think public speaking is one of the topics a lot of people have asked me about. And usually I would tell them that I don't have the answer because a lot of people think, I mean, not think, but I understand why they say that um, they would sort of want to seek advice from me in terms of public speaking. Maybe because I've done a few speeches and stuff like that, but I thought that I wouldn't be the right person for it. So I, I thought it would be best if I get a professional to, to, to do it. So obviously you're a um, public speaking coach for the national team of Namibia. Yes. And you're also a attorney, right? Yes. So yes. Obviously you do a lot more speaking than normal people. Would. Yes, I guess uh, yeah. I'm on a day-to-day -day basis and it's part of the job description. Yeah. Yeah, it entails speaking and you take it day by day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What got you into speaking? What, what interested you about speaking? Um, so it started off at a young age. So I remember when I was about 12, 13, 14 years old. So I come from a family of speakers, generally. So my mom and my sis at the time, she's currently late, were into journalism at the time. So then already when I was around 12, 13, I decided to join Utani Childline Radio. Um, and that also coincided with me going to Wintook High School at the time. And then from there, it sort of came like second nature to me. And I would say the rest is history. Yeah. So you have always knew speaking would be the career that you would eventually end up uh, doing. Um, so interestingly enough, I remember when I was around, again, that same age, I was thinking of becoming a medical doctor at the time. Okay. But then I realized every time we'd go for these injections yeah, yeah, yeah. or for these immune boosters, I was just always so scared. And I'm like, oh, just even the sight of blood. And I'm like, probably medicine is not for me. Yeah. Um, but then I fell in love with the, this, this thing of speaking at the time. So... I was at Wintook High School at the time. That's where I pursued my high school. But now that school was more based on prioritizing more active sports, such as your rugby, your soccer, your cricket, your athletics. So they did have, say, a public speaking society, a debating society, but it wasn't as active as the other sport codes that I just alluded to. So at the time, I decided, let me try and form part of the steam as a grade eight learner at the time. And then from there, I just fell in love with speaking. And um, I would see when we do debate competitions or tournaments, um, at the time our school wasn't really that good, especially I would say most of my high school career, our public speaking and debating team was relatively okay, but I wouldn't say it was the best, yeah. especially that would compete in the region, that would compete nationally at the time. We didn't have a lot of national speakers only maybe one or two that would make the cut whereas most of the national speakers would perhaps come from the north or other schools at the time the household um, public speaking and um, debate schools at the time was your commas high school and your winter gymnasiums and then winter high schools would just have that one or two that would join the the team yeah. so which ties into your question about um, what made me pursue this career of speaking I always felt um, there's a part of me where every time, you know, you'd go to family events, then all of them would be like, ah, definitely, he's also going to do journalism. Yeah. Uh -huh. He's also going to pursue that path. You know, it's in the family, it's in the blood. But it's not to say that I don't have an interest in journalism because I come from a household where you'd have to read the newspaper now and then. You'd also watch NBC News. But then at the same time, I asked myself, can I not pursue a career or pursue a path that will also entail speaking and then that's why i told myself around grade nine or grade eight grade nine that year grade eight towards the end of grade eight i told myself I'm going to become a lawyer one day and um hopefully it's still part of the dream i'm going to become a good lawyer one day that's the dream yeah yes nice um i usually notice that most people whenever you choose a career that's different from the norm that you were supposed to do like obviously I think there's a lot of people that, you know, when you ask them when they're kids what they want to do, they would say stuff like doctors and because those are the common things and your parents would be happy for you to do stuff like that. But usually when you choose a career that's a little bit different from what you've been envisioning to do, 
it's uh, when you've gotten feedback from people, like positive feedback. During the debates and stuff like that, did you have some people say that, people that gave you confidence to say like, no, this is actually a skill that I have to prioritize on? Yes, actually, um, I remember again where this whole passion all started brewing was when I was in high school. Um, when we did start with these competitions, I would also participate more in the Afrikaans uh, competitions. They used to refer to them as Redenar competitions back Afrikaans. in the day. Yeah, Redenar. Okay. And then for some reason, I actually realized I'm pretty good at it, especially with the reviews I was getting from my teachers, more specifically my language teachers, my English and my Afrikaans teachers at the time. And they were like, you know, actually, Clinton, why don't you decide to take this public speaking and debate thing serious? As in, um, you could put Vintuk High School on the map and you never know, this could be something that can go with you even after high school. Because I always tell people high school isn't a, an end in itself. It's a means to an end. Because after high school, you'll have to be absorbed in the whatever field you're going to take, whether it's university or you're going to decide to study art or you're going to decide to take the more conventional path which is maybe you you are more some people are gifted with working there with their hands for example that's why schools these days i'm happy that they are trying to allow learners to also pursue things such as craft and technology home economics because actually there is a market for that agriculture it's a market that we have not tapped into yet so um coming back to say that with the public speaking more i remember where it sort of started gaining traction was when i did that radio presenting and then it also spilled over um in my academics where specifically in my english orals presentations because of that skill i was crafting that i was working on it sort of empowered me because every time we're in class and we have an english lesson or an afrikaans lesson then the teacher would be like okay so are there any volunteers mm. to give an oral then i'll just see my friends like take their book and say no ma'am don't choose yeah, me like, or they want to look down yeah, yeah, yeah. and then at the time i just felt um because i was nervous i was also very very nervous i mean even till today sometimes when i have to oh but i'm not really in active public speaking and debate competitions but at the time that i was quite active I would also still get nervous mm. um, but then because you worked on that skill and that craft it allowed me to sort of garner the skill to not allow the nerves to take advantage of me so at the time in high school i remember grade like i said grade 8 to 11 our school wasn't on the map but then i'd say in matric that's when um, i would pick me and my fellow peers that were also part of the debating society um, public speaking and the debating society at the time put Vintuk High School on the map away at that time in 2013 that's when I was matric that's when Vintuk High School won the regional tournament for the first time in its history nice. and that year I actually participated in the public speaking category and I obtained silver mm. there's a part of me that thought I was going to get gold but I understood <laughs> the learner that got gold was a grade 8 learner mm. from St. Paul's at the time as well okay. and Probably it also had to do with the longevity of the project yeah. where you would be more in the system and I'm just finishing as well. So that is when we went to high school, was on the map, and then suddenly our school that was more sport-oriented, focusing on your rugby and your soccer and your athletics and your cricket, actually started prioritizing cultural activities like your debating, like your public speaking. And as we speak, I see our high school also do quite relatively well. A lot of good speakers have also come through the system. And it has spilled over way, for example, now, university, I also, um, at the time when I pursued my law degree, I also managed to join the debating club at the University of Namibia. Yeah. So I did my LLB at the University of Namibia, and there I also pursued my, pursued further, I pursued my public speaking and debate career. Further in my second year, I was the president of the debating club. Um, and it just generally assisted me in also leadership positions, teamwork positions. Because with debating and public speaking, sometimes you're on a team because you're representing a school or you're associated to a university and you're part of a team. So in debating in high school, yeah. there are three learners, say, on a proposition team and then three learners on an opposition team. So then you're sort of taught the skill of teamwork, yeah. prioritizing your team's case. What are your teammates' strengths and weaknesses and how do you sort of navigate through this team to ensure that the team does really well and that also assisted me when i um, became i remember in went to high school at the time i was also an lrc um, at that time especially being a person of color 
no, I'm kidding, being a black person, <laughs> it was really not... Yeah, you color me something else over here. Yes, yeah. actually, so being yeah. black, it was really sort of an achievement to be regarded as an LRC and then also going to university in my third year, I was the secretary general of the University of Namibia. And I can confidently say that part of those achievements are occasion to me having been part of the public speaking and the debating society and it's something that i've just pursued because even after high school i didn't take that path of maybe doing radio presenting because we can't each other radio when i turned 18 i'm not an adult i'm not a child anymore so you know the real the real world kicks in now real life kicks in yeah. so then um i didn't i also felt radio is also part of the media it's part of the media domain and i didn't always want to be in a shadow you know my shadow of my mom or my sister or you know, my uncles or aunts, I decided, you know what, Clinton, that little boy who had that dream of becoming a lawyer one day, uh, your dreams are valid. Yeah, nice. I think one of the most interesting things about high school is that those opportunities, like they say, the teacher would say, who has something to say, or well, you have to stand in front of the class and say something. Because the funny thing is that we speak every single day Yes. But when it comes to speaking in front of people, everybody freaks out, you know. Yes. So now it's like, um, what would you say um, differentiates public speaking? Because most of the time people think public speaking is just in front of a podium and the crowd is sitting down. But I think even regardless of the career path that you take, I think like public speaking is a very essential part of the field, you know. And uh, what would you say... If there were three key um, points that makes you an effective speaker, uh, what mm. would you pinpoint? Okay, so if I have to look at three key points to be a good public speaker, or at least uh, something that you can work on, the three things, I would actually like to label them with three letters. The first letter being P, the second letter being D, and the third letter being E. PDE. So, PDE. So okay. with the P, P stands for posture so even with the debate learners and the public speakers that i train these days in my free time the high scholars that i train um p stands for posture so i always say people will take you serious when you also stand a specific way so when okay. you stand with your chest up and your you know your breath out it also assists you with your voice projection as well whereas maybe on the contrary ways say you are standing and then you are slouching or you're yeah. leaning on the desk you can see you're not also very clear and also in terms of your audience they also they will see that um, you're not taking yourself seriously so i always say before people hear you they first see you so then they also see the way you stand so okay. i'd say the first aspect is posture which leads me to my second aspect which is the d for me the d stands for demeanor what do I mean by demeanor? Demeanor is the way you carry yourself. So what I mean by demeanor, it's also partly and mostly actually has to do with your personality, as in who is Nathan, who is Clinton. So sometimes in whatever speech you're going to have to give, it's an interaction with Nathan, like an interaction right now between Nathan and Clinton. So the idea with that is you'd want people to experience who you are as a person. So this also applies to everyday interactions. I always tell people that there shouldn't be a separation between um, when you're engaging with people on an everyday basis, be it with your family members or your peers, whether you're at work or at school, and when you're giving an actual speech, because you're still the same person. So public speaking is just an avenue, a domain where that is sort of control where maybe you're limited based on time and you're limited based on a specific topic that you're given. So that's the second aspect, which is demeanor. Your personality should come out and you'd notice under demeanor as well is in the beginning when you speak, you always say uh, what I always used to tell my high school learners is that I view you as like a bathtub with a clog or the clog in. So when you pour in the water, so for your demeanor to come out or your personality to come out, we have to take out that clog. Mm -hmm. so that it drains it has to come out it has to come out so then how does that personality come out the more you speak every time when you speak in the mirror the more public speaking competitions you participate in the more um, speeches you give the easier it becomes over time so that's for the demeanor the third one which is the e stands for eye contact mm -hmm. i'd say eye contact is also very very important and when i say eye contact i don't mean 
awkwardly staring someone in the <laughs> yeah. face or staring them down or staring a hole in their soul. Yeah. What I mean by eye contact is also partly what you can look at is when you look at your venue, look at your room. So if you're in a room, depending on how big the crowd is, if you see it's a smaller crowd of say five to ten people, it's always nice to tilt your eyes now and then like around the room. You know, so just so that everyone feels engaged. You don't want people to feel disengaged. And then when you're in a more uh, bigger or a yeah, bigger audience, what you'd want to do is, obviously, you won't be able to look at everyone at the same time. Say you're speaking with a crowd of 200 people, 300 people. But what you'd want to do is you'd want to position yourself in such a way that you're at least looking on top of the heads of the people. That way it still comes across as if you're giving them eye contact, you're giving them that attention. Mm -hmm. So in a nutshell, I'd say posture, demeanor, eye contact. Those threes are a good starting point in becoming a good public speaker. Nice. PDE. So posture, I think obviously it's like, it's like you said, people look at you first before they hear you speak. So I think as with your posture, that's it sort of show that you're not shy and then you're not con you're, you're not afraid it's kind of like people are attracted to confidence in a way it's like they trust you and also i noticed that the emotion that you have sort of rubs off on people so exactly. if you're confident people trust you more and they, they want to listen to you more exactly. you know so um uh, posture demeanor demeanor can be a bit um tricky like let's mm. say are you saying you should play to your personality more what what if what if what if you sort of like laid back shy quiet a little bit that's a really good question so there's a very thin line of demeanor and you over exerting your personality i believe it's part of the human experience of being shy so when you're yeah. about to give a speech it's normal for you to have sweaty pores maybe your mouth drying up a bit and you experience blackouts that's part of the human experience mm -hmm. however what i mean by demeanor now is where you ask yourself who you are okay. so sometimes you'd notice when people are experiencing this thing where, where whilst they're speaking they're stuttering or some of them they decide they start fidgeting and then they start using a less or they start saying um um, um the whole time yeah. it takes away from who they are because now the human experience of you being nervous or you blacking out is taking advantage of the person. Mm -hmm. So that basically means it's taking advantage of who you are. That's where your personality then comes out, where there's a thin line between um, you overexerting yourself. Because sometimes you also don't want to come across as too cocky or too um, blunt, as in, because people can also see through that because yeah. you can't fake it. It has to be a natural human interaction. So what I mean by demeanor is when you have a general conversation with um, a friend, you'd notice you're not really overthinking or you don't over explain. You're just being yourself. So the idea is just being yourself. Whereas on the other hand, when you're in a space where you're not that comfortable, you tend to be more quiet. It's like if you should take a child, for example. You notice children, generally, if they're in an environment or a space where they're not comfortable, you're more likely to see them sitting quiet, reserved. They're so tense yeah. because their personality is not coming out. Whereas on the other hand, when they're in an environment or a space where they're more comfortable, they're around their siblings, they're around their parents, they're around the teacher that they're comfortable with, you'll see that the learner is more themselves. They're yeah. being themselves. They're actually speaking to you. They're making jokes. They're comfortable. So the demeanor also ties in with you being a little bit more comfortable in your own skin. Mm -hmm. So for me, a very good example of this is if you look at the president, the late president, mm -hmm. for example, uh, may his soul rest in peace. Yeah. He is renowned for what he stands out for is he's able to encapsulate a crowd. Whereas, for example, when he's given a speech, you can tell that it's not um, 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 orated. What I mean is you can see his personality comes out every time he addresses the nation. You can feel that's my president. So the idea is you can feel his aura, his demeanor is coming out. And I feel that applies with day-to-day -day life. Sometimes you would be on the podium and then you'd see you'd be fumbling over your words. You are there rushing over your papers. You're yeah, like, ah. Yeah. And then when your time is done, then you always have that regret to say, ah, I wish I, I, just, I, wish I could have said this. Ah, there's so much I wanted to say. There's so much I wanted to do. That is your inner self speaking to you to say that if you were just a little bit more comfortable in your own skin at the podium, at that presentation, at that oral, at that interview, 
you would have most likely allowed your personality to come out and then you are going to bloom. Nice. I think I, I read about it once as well. It says like, you know, whenever you're being chased by a lion or something, um, there's two sides of your brain. Obviously, there's the, the front side, which is the analytical side, which helps you think things through. And there's the other side. I just forgot what the name is called. But that usually we call it like the f um, fight or flight um, thing, flight right? Flight, yes. So whenever it's like whenever there's a lion or something, you switch away from rationally thinking and then you choose your body takes over so it's like you start sweating Jeez. you start becoming super alert you know and i think that's usually what happens when people go in front of a crowd because they're scared it's something they're not comfortable doing most of the time and that's why when they get comfortable when they come back to themselves it's like their thinking faculties sort of like come back and they start like no, I should have said that. I should have done this. How do you think? Um, how do you get more comfortable? How do you get more comfortable in front of a, a crowd? Hmm. Yes, just to also echo and repeat what you were saying. Speaking is really not easy, especially when you're in the front of a crowd because you feel that little voice in your mind yeah. is saying, mm, "Oh my gosh, all the attention is on me now. Am I standing up properly? Am I speaking clearly? Is there something on my face?" That's that little voice that's speaking with you how to become confident is how do we say um, firstly I would recommend if your school or your university has a public speaking or a debating club that's a good starting point even Toastmasters Toastmasters is also a really good one mm -hmm. um, where it, you, you, you're forced to be in situations where you're challenging your fears you have to face your fears you have to face your demons so ideally when you're in a space where you can exercise and work on that that's a good starting point because you're also in a space with other people that have that same problem that you're also having, yeah. which is fear. Yeah. I mean, that fear, stage fright, it's normal. It's part of the human experience. But I'd also say, apart from you joining a public speaking or a debating club or a Toastmasters club, I recommend you can always start at home. So the idea is if you have a mirror at home, speak to yourself in the mirror. I mean, you have yourself for the rest of your life. So what you do is, even if you give yourself a topic, um, for example, rain or today, and then you time yourself. Maybe you speak for a minute. You look at yourself in the mirror. So then ask yourself, when you look at yourself in the mirror, after you've given your speech, you have that conversation with yourself. If other people were here, would they have taken me seriously as well? Because the sad reality is that if you don't take yourself seriously, other people are also most likely not to take you seriously as well. So it starts with you. So the idea of you being, uh, looking at yourself in the mirror, it's always a good starting point. Whereas when you have talks with yourself, sometimes when you're also speaking with your friend, it's also always nice in your free time, you have a friend, maybe your friend just, you ask your friend to give you tips or advice. Do you think I was clear? You know, you have a general discussion. It's just so that you can also audit yourself and you can also just see what you can work on. Um, but definitely, I really recommend um, if you're in a space where you can actually exercise speaking a lot, speaking whether it be competitive speaking or just general speaking, like it doesn't always have to be competitive speaking, like you have to say you're part of a university or, or you're part of a college and then it's like a competition based. Sometimes just generally also toast, Toastmasters is also just very, um, it, it's an activity where you, you obtain certificates as well. It also unlocks and untaps your creativity in your mind. Sometimes when you're writing more and then when you can transcend your, your, what you've written down into speech, like you bring it to life, that's so amazing. I also see sometimes there are these shows of um, poetry, yeah. poetry where people just poetry, spoken word. Sometimes those aren't debaters, those aren't public yeah. speakers. These are just individuals that actually have a gift that they never knew they had. So then they actually have a topic, then they go speak, where they're given a topic or a theme, and then they take you on this journey where they, you can start imagining and picturing um, what they're talking about. Whether that's their personal experience or not, that's just beautiful. It's like yeah, yeah. speech coming to life. Um, that's just the amazing thing. I always refer to it as magic. So every time, say, I would work with learners, at, at, as young as grade six, as grade seven, you see them embark on this journey of speaking where when they're giving a speech, they break down, they start crying. And I tell them, it's okay. It's fine. Cry if you have to. You can sit down, but we're going to do it again. You're going to do it again and again and again and again. 
then eventually after three years four years five years you know you see them become these speakers these household names yeah. you know you you see them speaking and then just that thought of when they come back to you and say sir thank you so much i remember three years ago four years ago i was so uncomfortable and then you actually created the space where i could face my fears you were on this journey with me and just that thank you it's like something that money cannot buy it's like you see these walking trophies it's like magic that's beautiful true 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 i like what you're saying facing your fears it's like um, some people say it's exposure therapy where if you're afraid of something, you need to do more of that thing, you know, so it becomes, becomes normal to you. And there's this, uh, uh, some people say, I mean, for the most part, I used to say like confidence is really abstract. It's hard to understand what it means, you know, but most of the time you'd find that it's more closely correlated with uh, competence. Like the, the more skills you have in a particular thing, you know, the, the easier it would feel for you and it would come forth as confidence, you know. So mm -hmm. if you've been speaking every single day, you know, for like 100 days, obviously like a single speech wouldn't feel like too much of a scare, you know, because you've done it so many times, you know, like, mm -hmm. like um, football players, basketball players, they practice so many times just for that one single day, you know, and it looks as if they so you know they're confident in the game but it's because they've done it so many times you know? yes it ties into um yeah. you're reminding me of uh, usain bolt yeah. said something profound where he said that he had to train for 10 years, 10 years for him to run a hundred meter race to run it in less than 10 seconds for example it's but he crazy. had to train for 10 years it yeah. also ties in i just thought while you was while you were speaking there yeah. it reminded me of cassius clay uh, better known as muhammad ali yeah, yeah. um you know, at the time, he, he, there's this one quote, he's renowned for two, two common quotes. The one quote is where he says, float like a butterfly, sting like, like a bee. bee. Yeah. And then the other one is where he says, fake it till you make it. In the beginning, I never really understood what he meant by fake it till you make it. But then one day he was also on a podcast where he spoke about before he became one of the best boxers of all time, he had to tell himself that he is the best, he is the greatest. He is going to win. He is going to win all these titles. He is going to overcome all of these things. He says he was quite fearful. And he said he spoke it into existence before it actually happened. True. So he said, I'm going to be the greatest of all time. I, there's no one better than me. I'm going to be the best. I'm the yeah. greatest. You know, I am Muhammad Ali. Doesn't matter whether you're black or white or blue or pink or yellow. That time he's a young black man. And remember, he was also during the time of um, col colonialism, yeah. apartheid for a black person to come out and you know have that confidence where he just says that it starts with you because for other people to believe in you you first have to believe in yourself true yeah that's true. where it all starts nice um do you have favorite uh, speakers orators if you were to name let's say two two orators um Hmm, that's a really nice one because there's so many yeah, yeah. there's so many that i look up to but there's one that i really um there's one okay with two i'll start with jordan peterson sure. so yeah. jordan peterson he's a psychologist a clinical psychologist by profession so what he does is he teaches he's a lecturer by trade but then he has these hour long podcasts yeah on different topics he will talk about life about death about love about relationships about careers what stands out with him is i like the fact that he's fluent and i also like the fact that he is very comfortable in his own skin what i mean by that is um because he lives like you know the other side of the world you know like first world nations but he doesn't identify as a feminist for example and then he is very open to go to discussions and have con open conversations about why he doesn't believe in uh, specific ideologies he's able to to stand his ground he's able to back up his position um even though he's saying a very liberal like he's coming from a western liberal democracy he's, he's coming from a western yeah he's coming from a western liberal democracy for example but then for him to stand out and explain why things are the way they are why don't we allow um why they are different specific he, he goes uh, hours on length where he talks about what what is the result of the pay gap the gender pay gap for example he talks about um, why is it that 
people are more likely to employ these specific individuals why generally why we shouldn't impose things such as uh, bee policies why it should naturally take place why is maybe why he believes in equity versus equality and he d- describes the difference between equity and equality and about how when you place people in positions of power because of their gender how people are more likely not to take them seriously and treat them as tokens and why you don't achieve that change that you want to achieve because now so you're not going to believe in this person because of their um, ability or their capabilities of doing their job but you feel that specific person is just there because of their gender or because of their race you know he goes hours on length so i really like uh, jordan peterson is um, one person I would, I would refer to another person that i would also um say a speaker and i really um, look up to i would say it's believe it or not it's my mom uh my mom uh, my mom is a journalist by profession menesia muño uh, so generally like people always used to see she used to be a news anchor actually um, but then currently she's still at the nbc as well but more behind the scenes but then just generally just her humility um seeing her being this powerhouse of a of a mom and her striking a balance between her work life and also her personal life you know having a family you know going to work working long hours coming home to a family also doing those you know motherly roles and doing it over such a long period of time or long time period i might come across as a mama's boy but generally i must say that yeah she's also one of the speakers generally i look up to as well she'd also give me tips and advice and mm-hmm. should always be on my case the idea of reading the importance of reading like i just didn't used to like reading at all I didn't like reading I didn't like uh, watching the news but at a young age I understood why she actually um, encouraged me to do more of that and I feel I'm now actually reaping the rewards of her hard work yeah nice I mean when you were speaking about Jordan Peterson I think I've been watching his stuff for like a bit the one thing that stands out with him is sort of like um, he has studied what he's speaking so much that it's from like a conviction point you know it's not just you know you find different speakers that read about something that sounds cool to say you know and then you just keep regurgitating things that you've heard or putting words together that sounds nice basically but he has sort of like studied what he's saying to the point where sometimes i don't necessarily think that he scripts what he's going to say but he has an idea and he's sort of exploring the idea on on stage you know going deeper you can also see him sort of like sometimes he hits a spot that he sort of discovers in front of people and you can see it that he sort of like um dives deeper into that thing but just because it's like comes from a point of passion conviction and i think most of the time if you're going to be a speaker or speak about something it needs to come from that point that you actually love and like you have a strong passion for what you for what you what you say right Mm. Um, i mean something unique that jordan peterson also said once where he was having a conversation with a a liberal because he identifies as a um, he he says he's not conservative or you'd say he's not a rightist or radical rightist but then um, he comes across as a rightist because you know if you're a leftist you're a liberal if you're rightist you're conservative it's more traditional yes it's more traditional yeah. but then there was a time where he was engaging a group of liberal individuals and then how that conversation ended was those individuals wanted to cut him off and cancel him and then he says would you say you're being liberal if you're willing to cut someone off mm-hmm. or not associate with someone from having a different world view than you are yeah. you really a liberal because the idea of liberalism is that exactly. you would accept someone even though it doesn't matter what their viewpoint yeah. is as long as your thoughts or your um world views don't harm the next person then what you you know express your type of freedom of expression or belief should be valid so then if people identify as being conservative or being religious or being traditionalist and supporting that traditionalist nature for example he talks about how you should allow individuals to be themselves so he just really got me thinking where it's like are you really a liberal you, exactly yes. true yeah. i mean debates debates i think are one of the things that uh, you meet in life you know sort of like at work or whenever you have to stand your ground you need to know exactly why you stand in your ground um you've done a lot of debates right so what you think uh 
Maybe let me start with what was your favorite topic to, to debate? Sure. Um, that's a really nice question. Yes, I remember it was in my second year law school at the time. My yes. second year law school and we went for a university tournament. It was the varsity debate championships. That time it was taking place in Johannesburg, South Africa. Sorry, Cape Town, South Africa. So then at the time, you know, because of the university debates, um, usually we, we use the British parliamentary debating format. So it's like two people per team. Mm -hmm. So there are four teams, uh, opening government, opening opposition, closing government, closing opposition. So at the time, you know, I'm at the time I'm with my debate partner at the time, uh, Emma Theophilus. Um, she also, we studied together. I think she's currently... The Emma Theophilus, the ICT. Minister. Yeah, she's currently the minister of I ITC, nice. yes. And then she was also my debate partner at the time. So we went to this tournament and then now we were in what we refer to as a top room. So what happens at university tournaments is that you are in there are nine rounds and then after nine rounds then there's a top 16 then it comes down to the quarter final semi-final then the final so then the 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 more well you're doing in the tournament the higher you bump up so if you're in a room where you're facing these really really good teams because we'd always revere and admire these universities like your ucts your vets your free state university so i remember the one round i believe it was round five or six and then um, we were in a room with now, we refer to them as the big chickens. Mm. Big chickens is now you're in a room. I remember there was a team, of, there was a UCT team, a VETS team and a Free States team. And then we are a team from, you know, the University of Namibia, you know, and debating at the time was also not very as advanced as it is right now. So then the, the motion, it's actually a topic, but a motion, the motion at the time was this house will implement Good Samaritan laws. Good this Samaritan this house will implement Good Samaritan law. So then that motion had an info slide. The info slide was, uh, if you see somebody is about to drown mm. and there's no lifeguard or anything, and that person's a drowning and you as a pedestrian or a bystander doesn't do anything to help the person, you can actually be held criminally liable for that. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you see people in the street, maybe someone is being beaten up in the street and then you're walking past or you're driving past and you don't do anything about it, and then there's evidence that you didn't do anything about it. You can actually go to jail or you can get a high fine for it. So thankfully, in that topic... Were you guys for it? We were against it, actually. Really? We were against it. That's and then we went up against, obviously, these household universities. And I remember the time when I was with Emma, we were in closing government, closing opposition. Sorry. So closing opposition. So luckily, we get to speak last. And then I remember the type of arguments because we ran these legal arguments. These legal arguments were things that we learned in school for example where we actually had this photographic understanding where if she gave an argument i know where she's going with it you know so then i would sit there and be like oh there you go partner i see where you're going with it so then i remember we advanced two i two main ideas that was unique in the whole debate where we advanced this idea about how the state or the government is an omnipresent teacher what we meant by that is anything they regard as normal um it then influences that general society. So what we mean by that is once you hold people liable for being in a position where maybe they could do little to no help, you make pedestrians and you make bystanders victims as well. Because what we mean by that is sometimes, because in the info slides, if you see someone is drowning, the reason why I'm probably not doing something is probably not because I can. Say, for example, I can't swim. Mm -hmm. It's not that if I could swim, obviously, I would most likely, being a human yes. being, I'd, I'm more likely to jump in the swimming pool and I'm more likely to try and save that individual. That I'm more likely to do so. But chances are, if I see someone drowning, it's not that I maybe I get some, I derive some type of pleasure of seeing people struggling or suffering. So then mm -hmm. we spoke about how you treat bystanders and pedestrians as victims and we showed why that's bad the second argument we ran was this idea we, we refer to it as the theory of recidivism mm. but the we mean theory of the theory of recidivism, recidivism. Okay, the, so what a, what recidivism yeah. is basically it's this idea that punishing people harshly punishing people harshly turn them into harsher criminals mm. so punishing people harshly turn them into harsher criminals so say you take an ordinary Samaritan, someone walking in the street. Okay, there was a car accident. You decided you didn't go open a case or decided you decided not to be a witness. 
you then go to jail so you go to imagine maybe i'm just an ordinary student trying to live my life mm. i'm held liable for not assisting people people were in a fight i decided not to assist them so i go to jail and you know when you go to jail you're exposed to things such as drugs yeah gun violence knives so i went in innocent so then i go to jail and i pick up all of these harsh things so then chances are when i come out of jail i've probably learned how to stab i've learned how to engage in drugs and i just become a hardcore criminal a harsh criminal you know because of something that was most likely outside of my control so then on a way up in that specific motion we just managed to persuade the judges why it's not necessary it's a good idea in principle to have good samaritan law laws but we just managed to sway the judges that day why practically it's not going to be a good um practically just yeah. wouldn't work you know and work. then we came first and that we actually shocked and then we really? celebrated like yes and then that year we ended up qualifying but unfortunately i know we uh lost in the quarter final but it was definitely a, a good run yeah well that's a, i was just thinking about the two sides when you were when you brought that topic up also you wouldn't want the government to sort of tell you what to do and if you don't do it they arrest you it's sort of like a draconian i think draconian regime that's what they call it yes yes yes, yeah, yes, like, yes i mean they can they can police you on the things you've done if the things you've done are not correct but they can't force you to do something you know yes. that ultimately isn't a it's not a i mean it sounds nice just like a lot of things you know that aren't necessarily morally correct they sound nice in theory but practically it's, it doesn't make sense yeah. exactly yeah. exactly okay how would you how would you craft a speech let's say most of the time um, sometimes people have opportunities to speak in front of people you know uh, you have a topic um, let's say you've been practicing in front of the mirror you know but now how do you especially now that a lot of people like the attention span is really small you know people you need to sort of entertain them and give them information at the same time so they don't lose you you know it's good that maybe the topic or the um what you're about to tell them is really important but the way you tell it is just not in entertaining to listen to you know how, how would you craft a speech let's say if you were coaching someone mm, okay so so if you're going to craft a speech be it in public speaking or even debating for that matter basically also those basics that we were taught in high school goes a long way where they say that there's an introduction and yeah. there's a body then there's a conclusion what i always used to tell my students is um when you're going to give a speech it's always to try it's always important to try and paint a picture mm -hmm. by painting a picture is that take me on a journey i want you to take me on this specific journey that i want to journey with you and how you take me on that journey is by having a conversation with me Okay. And I always say the best speakers are ones that are relatable to your educated, your well-spoken individuals, your your people that generally do speaking on a daily basis. They should be able to appeal to that person and the lay person on the street in mm. the exact same speech. You'd want to be relatable to your average Joe. What you're saying should be clear, it should be concise, and it should be relatable to everyone. You don't want to give a speech where you come across as um, if you're having this topic about economics and you start talking about economies of scale or something that's not relatable. You want to give a speech that even if there's a meme or a tate on the street that's listening to you, they actually want to understand what you're also saying. So when you take them on a journey, it's by having a conversation. So when you say, when you're having a conversation with someone, it's like, hi, how are you? And then I won't be like, oh, Nathan, did you see that the sky is blue? And then mm. I'm like, ah, but Nathan, uh, do you see, like, did you know that water is actually a gas? And then I start jumping. <laughs> There's no structure. You know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. the same way you have a conversation, you try not to fumble or confuse things. It's important to take people on a journey. So if you have a topic, I always say you start from the beginning. So when you have your introduction, you have your topic, you have your theme. I always say also what makes speakers unique is when you take a different angle. When you take a different angle or when you go deeper. What I mean by going deeper is that people generally when they're preparing speeches i always say um don't talk about the first things that come to your mind so if you say you got a topic say for example dear santa mm. when you and you're given 15 minutes to prepare for that topic 
those first thoughts that come to your mind like oh dear santa may i please have an iphone 15 <laughs> santa please if i was bad don't give me a, a sock of coal mm. or santa you know this year when you come down the chimney make sure that you greet my parents those first things that have come to your mind the other learner or the other student has also Probably. thought about it that's the chances are whatever those first thoughts that come to your mind the next person also thought about it so what you'd want to do is think about it but then think further than that outside of that you know so with that same topic so for example dear center and then you just maybe take it from the perspective of ah how i wish we are in a society where skin color doesn't matter mm -hmm. when i think of you when i think of you center i think of you being white and having this gray beard but actually why do i think you're white center nice you know <laughs> Could That's Santa not be black? You see, yeah, so yeah. the idea of thinking outside of the box as well. So what I recommend is introduction, body, and a conclusion. So another way of remembering an introduction, body, conclusion is also by, um, I always tell my learners again, there are three things. So we, when you give a speech, tell them what you're going to tell them. Then you tell them. Then you remind them of what you've told them. So you tell them what you're going to tell them, then you tell them, then you remind them of what you've told them. So you would notice it's also like having an introduction, a body, and a conclusion. Nice. Okay. And then, so it's that first aspect. So from a structural perspective, the tip I would give is introduction, body, conclusion, where you tell them what you're going to tell them, you tell them, and then you remind them of what you've told them. And the second perspective is think of uniqueness, substance. We refer, in debating, we refer to them as nuances. Nuances is you tiny think, details yes yeah, the yeah. tiny details yeah, yeah. so you have to think outside of the box what's going to make uh, nathan stand out when they're going to present this speech what's going to make clinton stand out when they're going to present that speech i think that will also go a long way in assisting in preparing for a speech nice nice i like that i like that introduction body conclusion introduction is obviously like you say you tell them what you're going to tell them you know the short version and then you actually tell them, and after that you remind them of what you told them. And they conclude. Um, mm. Do you have favorite books that you? Do you have a book list that you would recommend someone to read? Yes. But you think books are important in talking, in general? Very much. Um, I'd always say this. Also, this um, there's this quote I read the other day where it was by it's by an unknown person where he says if you'd want to hide something from an african person just hide it in a book yeah so say for example you have a 200 dollar note or something yeah, yeah, yeah. and say you're at home and you want to put it in a place where you think people won't go check like your piggy bank or your wallet put it in a book it's the safest place the safest place because that <laughs> would probably be the last place someone would, someone will check them, yeah. so books that i'd recommend i'm a huge fan of um paulo culo Mm. Paulo Kulo, he wrote two books, um, Alchemist. The Alchemist, yeah. actually, yes. The Alchemist is a really good book that I recommend. But then there's another book as well, um, where the book is The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. Mm. The, monk who's, yeah. the, the Monk Who Sold know, His Ferrari. Cool. Why that book... Um, resin uh, so what I recommend, Paulo Kulo is for me a good artist, uh, a, a good writer. And then the... Oh, generally, okay, apart from Paulo Kulo... Um, I'm also a lot, I'm, I'm into history, so books by Nelson Mandela, mm -hmm. you know, the, the struggle of the freedom. I also used to like books on, you know, like history, politics, but it's not everyone's cup of tea. So I don't want to now start talking about Malcolm X <laughs> or, you know, Black Panther, because it's yeah. not really relatable to everyone. But someone that's relatable to just anyone is, okay, Paulo Kulo. The, the book that really, um, that I liked about him was the, the one about the, the monk. The monk who sold this Ferrari. I think it's no, him, though. It's it's not Paulo yeah, Kulo. Yeah. The monk who sold I, this. I, I, I no, know that. Robin Sharma. Robin Sh sorry, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry, yeah. Robin Sharma. Yes, sorry. Yeah, yeah. There's Paulo Kulo who wrote The Alchemist. Yeah. Then The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. That's by Robin Sharma. Yeah. And then Robin Sharma also wrote another book of The Leader Without a Title. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so those two authors I recommend. The reason why I recommend... Um, uh, Robin, Robin Sharma, um, especially when I read that book of the monk who sold his Ferrari, I felt he was speaking to me because it's basically about a lawyer. Um, this lawyer, he reached stardom 
um, he was an associate at a firm he had all of these fancy flashy cars and you know he was a top lawyer and then he was basically he never committed to a relationship and he had all of these um what are they referred to what is the fancy term call girls call girls yeah call girls for yeah. example it was yeah call girls for example so then um one day he had a case that he had to present um by the way he was also mentoring um an upcoming lawyer i think I forgot his name now john no let's let's for all intents and purposes, let's refer to him as John. Yeah, yeah. So then John was now doing his articles, looking up to him now because he's doing all of these really, really great things. You are strict, you'd work long hours, drink, party. Mm -hmm. One day he had a case, a um, murder case actually that he had to, where he, the, the, the accused ended up being sentenced for a really long time. Then gets a heart attack. He gets a heart attack. Uh, then he goes to the hospital. So that time this lawyer that he was grooming took his position period passes by three months six months eight months a year passes by where is um the stop lawyer you know is nowhere to be found four or five years later you know this lawyer that was groomed by the other lawyer now that got the heart attack he now takes the position of that top lawyer he becomes an associate he's winning the cases he's driving the flashy cars one day secretary was like there's someone here to see you uh then they're like no he's i'm busy i'm busy then when he walked in it was that he couldn't recognize he's like who are you when the person started speaking then he's like ah you know that's the lawyer that actually you know got the heart attack five years later you know he's back he looked younger he looked vibrant he cut off his beard he looked healthier and then basically starts talking about his story about how he went to india and how he managed to you know experience life for the first time he talks about all of these uh things that we are chasing money yeah. fame um money fame you know all of these things you know you probably want to dress you know you want to wear these brands maybe versace or gucci or you want to dress you know these gucci brands he talks about that uh, these things don't really matter at the end of the day what really matters is family it's making a difference in other people's lives and about how those things go a long way so i felt like that book resonated with me especially as a young person uh i mean we also go through our struggles um when, for example, you when you hear the, when you read these articles about how the unemployment rate is high, we're going through inflation, and about how young people are struggling to get jobs, it's an actual reality. How people with degrees from four or five years ago are still at home, they still go study their masters, they're still at home. How the market is so saturated, and then you start feeling the pressure, you start to turn to things such as you know alcohol, drugs, to temporarily forget the pain you actually realize that what are you chasing you know what i mean so you you realize that we're especially in an age now at a time where social media is influencing you know the idea of you checking statuses and then you say ah all of a sudden now people are having the latest iphone they're traveling you know they're going to cape town you know that you know people are caught up in this thrive culture the hookup culture it's all of this you know life is happening very fast then you realize like that's actually not life that's not what actually matters so reading books actually gives you a different perspective so those authors um paulo culo robin sharma yeah the, if i talk about the leader without a title again it resonates with me guy that was at a bookshop this is generally how you don't need status to actually make change yeah. um it goes a really really long way and i like the fact that you'd use these anecdotes and you'd use these practical examples to actually tell his story and you're like wow you know what i mean so i can actually pitch i'm like on this journey so those two um writers I, i'd recommend yes yes yeah i, li I like books i mean uh, paulo coelho the alchemist for me what was so interesting is that it's it's like a allegory it's like a story and then there's lessons in those stories it's it's easier for me to remember the lessons like if it was just like a book of facts you know one two three four five you know like a week after that, you would forget it. But because you remember the story, like just the story that you uh, narrate now, it's like it reminds you of what the message behind that story was. Right? Yes. yes. Um, exactly. I mean, I do, I'm actually into software. So oh, okay. recently I've been noticing, like before, you know, there was that saying where people say, show me your friends and I will tell you who you are, right? But now it's like almost, um, I've noticed if someone would take my phone, and they would go for my YouTube history list. They, would, they could actually have a clear image of what goes on in my head because of the things I keep watching and watching and watching. Let's say like the podcast or the information that I find interesting. What would you say um, 
what do you watch, let's say on YouTube? Like, what's what interests you in terms of podcasts, documentaries, or just、mm. pranks or what? What what you watch daily、mm. or frequently? Yeah, frequently. Because I would say generally, um, because especially because now I'm in a space where I'm like forced to read,、uh, but for sounds really like. I'm not enjoying what I'm doing. Sorry for that.、Yeah. So because I'm in a space where like reading is necessary. Reading is necessary. So when I'm usually on YouTube, when I'm listening to podcasts, um, it's also very general. So what I mean by general is when I'm on YouTube, I'll probably the document or not even say document. What I'll usually listen to again, it's it's pretty boring. But I'll say Card Blanche. Okay. Um, Card Blanche. Generally, ever since I was young. I would always just watch it,、uh, just general. I'll just watch it, but then what I'd maybe listen, what I'd maybe listen to generally, ah, I usually I wouldn't have a specific preference or go-to person I'd listen to or watch. But I like、um, I like people like Trevor Noah, you know, people that try and make jokes to just、yeah. you know. Sometimes I'd listen to the Daily Show,、yeah. you know. It's really funny, you know, just for you to just laugh a bit, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, just where you just. See, were you in a space where you can just laugh, or you can shut down, or sh- shut away from the real world, you know, a little、yeah. bit? Where he'd also use these serious scenarios, you know, just to use these、um, happy. I don't know, like you try to lighten up the mood, like you'll talk about serious issues like race,、yeah. um, but he's using it in a very like、um, comical way. S- in a, like there's a lot of satire in what、mm-hmm. he says, and I just feel like that's relatable. So usually. I would just usually like something uplifting, you know. And、yeah. usually when I'm on YouTube, I'm just listening to music. Like maybe sometimes you just read a good book. You just listen to music in the background, you know. No specific preference.、It、can be R and B, hip hop, can be house music. It can be local music. Just listen to music. Usually when I'm on YouTube, I'll just be listening to just general music because I feel like it's good for the soul. It's good for your energy. Yeah. 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 No, that's nice. Nice. Okay. What would you, if you if you look back to when you were a teenager,、um, you growing up, what would you tell yourself if, you, if there's something to tell? Like now that you know what you know now,、um, and obviously there's a lot of young people that might find themselves in the same situation that you were in. You know, obviously in high school, I don't think you have a clear representation of what the actual world is like. You know, obviously when you get to university, it's like Um, they give you different choices of what you think you know、um, the world would look like, and as soon as you get off university, it's like it's a whole different reality. Right? How would you, if you were to give yourself a blueprint, what would you?、Um, how would you summarize it? Like, that's a good one.、Um, the most important thing I would tell my younger self is、um, develop a routine. So that's the one thing I really struggle to develop. I mean, even till today, I don't always get it right. So what I mean by routine is, you need to be accountable to yourself.、Um, so it's two things. The first thing I would say, develop a routine, and then the second thing I would tell my younger self is, try and develop to have a healthier diet as well, because it goes a really long way. So, so I would say, for example, with the routine thing,、um, you need to try and wake up. At a specific time, and to go to sleep at a specific time, because with a routine, it also has to do with your discipline. So when you have these fluctuating hours, so sometimes you're sleeping at two midnight, and then you're sleeping at eleven, and then you're sleeping at twelve. The body is not、it's、used to rhythms. I think、Sorry? we call it circadian、yeah. rhythms or something. Yeah,、like、right, yes, yeah, yeah. it's it's not right because then sometimes you struggle to wake up in the morning because you're forced to wake up because you have to go to school, you have to go to Maybe work, but then developing a routine will go a long way. The idea of you say waking up five a.m. in the morning again. There's another book, Five A.M. Club. I haven't、mm-hmm. read it yet. I was recommended yeah, yeah, yeah. to、so、to read it because the early that saying of the early bird catches the worm actually makes sense. The idea of you work、um, waking up when you wake up five a.m. Most people are sleeping that time.、Mm-hmm. So the idea is you'd always want to work on yourself, personal development. So the idea of you trying to be part of the top. Two or three percent in the world. It starts by waking up early. So when you wake up early, you are developing a level of discipline. So it means you'll see there are smaller benefits that come from that. Where 
you're more likely to be on time, respect someone's time when you have a meeting to go to. Because when you wake up, say you meditate or you're writing down notes, you're planning your day, having your coffee, you are a few steps ahead of your day than the other person. And if I could tell myself that at a really young age, it would um, go a long way as well. It would really, really go away. It would go a long way because that would mean like you, you, you learn to discipline, you know, waking up a specific time, going to bed a specific time, um, respecting that, uh, you know, 8 o'clock is 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock is 10 o'clock. Because I struggled when I was in university. You have a 9.30 lecture, maybe it's a two-hour class, then you walk in the class at maybe 10 o'clock, 10.30, you already missed an hour. It's because I didn't have a routine. I'd maybe say I have a 7.30 lecture and then because I will, I'll go sleep at 12 midnight or 1 and maybe I'm reading or I'm watching a series or whatever I was watching, series or I'm catching up on football news, I missed the 7, 7.30 class, you know what I mean? So because of I didn't have a routine. So that's the first thing. The second thing I'll tell my younger self, being healthy, guys, being healthy is difficult. Even me trying to drink water. Um, I never really used to drink water. I remember just my colleague, uh, my colleague, uh, Lavinia Utoni, for example, because I've been working with her for a little bit more than two years. Mm -hmm. I'd always just be drinking gassy drinks. I'm drinking my cold drink. Oh, I was a huge fan. Fanta Orange, <laughs> Fanta Orange Coke yeah. was my go-to. But then I remember after a year, so she asked me, Clinton, I've never seen you drink water. Why don't mm -hmm. you drink water? Simple things, because it's boring. Who wants to drink water? Yeah. So what I mean by being healthy i'm not saying become a vegetarian or become vegan no but you would realize eating clean actually helps you with your thinking so now and then when you're eating salad or when you're eating a high protein diet um generally like especially because i always thought you know you know these people they'd always try and you know they'd say they want to join the gym yeah. You pay your gym membership, you sign your one year contract <laughs> and then three, four months, you just not, you don't go to the gym. Exactly. But then someone interests, because I'll try and, you know, um, when I say exercise at home, it's probably jog, you know, do some push-ups, sit-ups. But then someone told me like, it doesn't help you do push-ups, sit-ups, you're going to the gym, but your diet is not right. Because it's supposed to be 70% diet True. and then 30% is the working out. Because it doesn't help now, you work out you go to the gym but then you're just eating sweets the whole day you're just eating chocolate the whole day some people have a theory that ah, i can just go run it off but it, it doesn't assist you in any way so just having that balanced diet where you can have maybe you can eat more healthy you know what i mean um it's very difficult i'm not saying it's easy so i'll tell my younger self because even i struggle with it sometimes you know i feel so guilty when i'm drinking a gassy drink or when you're having your beer you know like when you're having your beer, you feel a bit guilty because you feel tired the next day. But probably had I um, incorporated eating healthy when I was younger. Imagine 12 year old me eating fruits, vegetables. By the time I'm what, fast forward, you know, 10 years later, 15 years later, I would have probably been used to it. And then uh, because I'm not feeling the after effects now, but then I'm also speaking to myself, not just as a child. I'm probably speaking to 60 year old me, yeah. 80 year old me. You know, will I still be mobile? Will I still be healthy? Can I still, you know, when I'm with my kids and my grandkids, they say, no, dad, let's go to the dunes or let's go ride a bicycle. Will I still be active, you know? And it will help with those two things, having a routine mm -hmm. and having a more balanced diet. It will teach you discipline as well. Um, also to that, what I also forgot is, uh, I remember my one, um, is is. is He's my cousin, but we grew up as brothers. We actually lived together as well. But he tells me the first step of respect or self-respect is what you put in your body. Mm -hmm. That's, that's when you, how you determine whether or not you respect yourself is what do you put in your body. So if you're just eating sweets, chocolate, you know, you're spoiling yourself with KFC the whole time. It says a lot about what you think of yourself as well. So he tells me like, Forget about even before you even ask yourself, do you respect other people? Ask yourself, do you respect yourself when you are eating all this junk food, when you're True. drinking all these gassy, gassy drinks? Ask yourself, do you really respect yourself? Do you respect your body? Yeah. So, yeah. Nice. Shout out to my younger self. Well, I like the discipline thing because usually in high school, we used to have a principal. He would say, a disciplined child is a successful child. You know, I, I didn't used to understand it because I think most people have their own strong points. Like 
some people are good at speaking, some people are really smart at school, you know. Everybody has a strong point, but there's, I believe, like, God does not give you everything. Like, it's like, um, I was, uh, like, the Chinese would say there's that circle, whatever they call it, the yin, 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 yin and yang, yin, right? yin, yin, Yeah, it's like, yin, I th- and yang, yeah. yin and yang, yeah. I think you have one part of it, but the other part is like, one part is given to you as a gift, you know, like, Obviously, some people are just genetically gifted. Like, if, you, if you're tall, like, basketball players are tall. But still, like, Kobe Bryant would say, like, um, most of the people in his team were actually really good. They had a gift. He could see they have, they have a gift. But the only way he could sort of outshine them is if he put in as so much work that they were not able to put in. You know, every single day he would... He would like they would have practice sessions, I think, in the evening. So he would practice in the morning, in the evening. So every single day, twice. So by the time they were to catch up to him, it's it's too late. Like he had a lot of reps in hard work beats hard talent. Work. Exactly, hard work beats talent. Yeah. Yes. So you have you have your own talents, but the one thing that yeah. guarantees that you will be able to make it is. Every single day, like you say, discipline. Discipline. Wake up, 5 a.m. club. 5 a.m. club, yeah. yeah. I really, I, I like that. I think if there's one thing that young people could do, especially if you're young, you have, you have, you have benefit of time. You know, the earlier you begin, you know, the yeah. um, better it's going to be for you. There's but, this theory that um, at the age of 30, because we're moving towards a very technological age, they say everyone over the age of 30 won't have to run again for the rest of their lives. Mm. So you'd notice, especially growing up now, um, especially during our time when we were young, you know, you'd go outside, play a bit in the mud, yeah. you know, you'd do sand castles, you'd, you know, go visit a friend, ride a bike. But the way the world is evolving and changing, people are more on their cell phones, they are it's more crazy. on technology. Mm-hmm. It's like you're becoming less mobile because you're becoming, um, this one person referred to them as like, our minds are being engineered on becoming docile. Docile is you just want this dopamine. Yeah. So you're just you're just scrolling the whole time, Instagram, Facebook, yeah. because you're not actively using your body anymore to go outside, having interactions. Sometimes you go out, the first thing people do, take out their phones. Mm-hmm. You know, they're not being social anymore. You're not using your brain to actually focus. And it's taking away from your focus because you can't focus on a specific thing anymore because you keep scrolling, you're checking someone's status. Oh, you know, that's all you're doing, like slowly but surely. It's like your brain is just looking for this dopamine pleasure, you know. We're not yeah. using our bodies anymore to be active, running, yeah. jogging, you know, just being active. So those things are actually quite important. True. And like uh, what, what reminded me when you said about technology, it's like everything is made to be so fast. Like before, I think people would get their lessons from like life, you know, like Plants take a long time to grow. Mm. You plant it today, you don't go check it up every single day. Mm. You know, it takes like maybe six months, but patience, people don't have that patience. Like if they want to start something today, like let's say working on your speaking, like they would start something today by, you know, like the end of the week, they felt like it, they, they've done so much, like they tired. But if you look at the people in the past, they would do things for like years before they were actually good at it. Mm-hmm. But I think the references we have now, it's like TikTok. TikTok is like really quick. Like if you can't entertain me in like two seconds, mm. they give up, you know, this mm. mm. switch, switch, switch. But people just don't have that appetite for like um, long, patient. Patience, no. Yeah, exactly. yeah. We can't Hard focus. Work. Yeah, they want that. Yeah. Mm. Nice. No. I think do you do you give do you are you open to giving um, lessons and stuff like that? Where can people find you if someone would want to reach out to you? Yes. Um, so basically, um, I have an academy actually that I started in 2019. I actually started coaching in because I finished high school 2013, and then immediately 2014, as a 19-year-old, I started coaching high scholars and then in university. And here we are. So I only started at the academy in 2019. It's referred to as ML Speech Refinery. ML Speech Refinery is basically a public speaking and a debating academy. So what we usually do through that academy is um, we host high school tournaments, uh, be it debating, public speaking. What we also 
do is um, individuals that are lecturers that are um, in positions where they have to speak a lot, where you're a teacher, you're a lecturer. So we give you sort of tips and pointers. I'm not alone, by the way. I have a team. Yeah. The team, um, um, we also went through the speaking journey together, went through the public speaking tournaments. It's not a one-man show. I also believe in empowerment. Some of the learners I used to work with myself, now they are also speakers in their own rights. They have their own identity. They're not in my shadow, for example. So they're speakers in their own rights. So what we do is we host tournaments um, usually, but uh, we can do more. Um, Generally, so we reach out to high scholars, universities when we host high school and debating tournaments. So we usually have contributions um, because unfortunately, the country doesn't really have a market for debating. The same way, debating and public speaking, the same way you would look at your soccer, your rugby, your cricket. Yeah. Unfortunately, debating is not in the same bracket. There isn't a budget for it. The same way they prioritize other extramural activities. And that's one of my dreams that I would wanted to change. One of my dreams are for us to have debating part of the school curriculum, for example. Public speaking and debating to be part of the school curriculum. The same way we could teach learners about life skills and the same way we used to teach them about religious and moral education. I feel like this is a skill that can really change lives, you know, that's not in the school system. But coming back to the academy, we have to start somewhere. So with the academy, reach out to university scholars and high scholars. Recently as well, the people that would reach out to us um, are also uh, models. So people that have these dreams of uh, participating in these pageants, beauty pageants, models, they actually, because I understand that there's uh, phases to it, there's the walking aspect and then there's also a speaking aspect where they test you on your, maybe your physique and yeah. the way you, you walk and then there's also a part where you are asked a question. So then we would also work with uh, uh, models or people that have pageants coming up, lecturers, teachers, and it's not always a group base to say we just focus on high school learners or primary school learners or university learners if it's if it requires speaking um i feel we ml speech refinery can assist you where you can reach us um i always say instagram is a starting point um you can find me on my instagram handle uh, my handle is becoming sir clint um, i feel i'm not him yet but i'm in the process of becoming sir clint basically now the name got on is especially when i started training the, coach, the learners would always be like, Sir, Sir. Then they're like, Sir Clinton, Sir Clinton. Mm. Then it became Sir Clint, Sir Clint. Mm. And then it's just something that caught on, you know. So I'll refer to it as a, as an alias yeah. or an alter ego, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. So you then reach out to me on um, Instagram, Facebook as well. Say my name's becoming Sir Clint. And then, you know, DM me or, um, you know, yeah, DM me or reach out Um if there's maybe fly sometimes we post flyers as well and then my number will be there let's talk let's have a coffee let's see how we can assist you let's see how we can the nice thing is we don't have a fixed program what we do is we tailor make the program to suit your needs and to suit what you want to do if you don't want to be the person where we put you in front of crowds or you have to speak competitively that's fine if you also want to be that person where you're put in front of crowds we want to speak competitively that's also fine so i believe the academy is fundamentally a safe space it's actually i'd say the people i want is i want the nervous people i want the shy people yeah. i want to work with the nervous and the shy people it's like a hospital with sick people a hospital shy. with sick people exactly yeah. they i think it's also analogous with churches as well yeah churches are not for the righteous people are for those people that feel actually want to you know encounter god or to be with my deity to connect yeah. to the with the deity for example so it's the same way the academy is the starting point for the shy the nervous the reserved the soft spoken i'm speaking to you yeah you Frankly, i think anyone can benefit from a public speaking because you do it everywhere like in your at your job with your friends you know communication is like everywhere you know so i think I'll put the links in the description as well, so it's easier for them to... Awesome, yeah. awesome. Yeah. That's what's up. <laughs> no, good to have you, man. It was really awesome. Thank yeah. you, Nathan, for the opportunity. Uh, appreciate it for the time. Thank you, Namibia. All right, sure. Cheers, man. Cool.